Good evening. My name is Sam Zork, and I am president of the Rice University Federalist Society. As the first undergraduate student chapter of the broader Federalist Society organization, we are committed to facilitating civil discourse on the pressing constitutional law and public policy issues facing our nation today. Our motto, as you can see, is debate, discuss, decide. To that end, it is a pleasure to have so many people here this evening to be a part of that growing dialogue. As our first event of the academic year, we are excited to be hosting this debate on President Trump's immigration and travel ban executive order between John Malcolm of the Heritage Foundation and Randall Kelso of South Texas College of Law. Moderating our debate will be Dr. Paul Brace, the Clarence L. Carter Chair in Legal Studies and Professor of Political Science here at Rice. Dr. Brace specializes in comparative subnational judicial politics and policy, American political institutions, and public opinion. He has published four books and over 50 articles and chapters that have appeared in the top journals and volumes in political science and policy. He serves or has served on 10 editorial boards and has received nine National Science Foundation grants. Over three decades, he has won multiple awards for research, teaching, mentoring, advising, and has routinely appeared in international, national, and regional media. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Oregon and master's and PhD from Michigan State University. Dr. Brace, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sam. Good evening. Good evening. It's been eight short months, and there have been a lot of events, as you know. Among the more controversial events has been the question of the travel and immigration ban offered by the president. We've gone through three iterations of this ban, the first seemed to be devoid of any lawyers. The second seemed to have lawyers who were holding their nose and trying to prop the immigration ban up. And why did it fail? Well, the stated reason in the federal courts were under the statute that allows a president to unilaterally ban immigration, they can only do so for specific reasons. And in Mark I and Mark II of the immigration ban, in Mark I, there was basically no justification other than the president wanted to do it. Mark II got a little better, but the reality was it left the judges with very little as a basis for the ban other than what candidate Trump and President Trump had either said or tweeted. And so they were rejected because that was insufficient. The third iteration has benefited from significant lawyering, smart lawyering, and lots of consultation, multinational, lots of consultation with agencies within the government. And it added countries that weren't exclusively Muslim. And so before the, the, the issue before the Supreme Court was going to be whether or not a presumption of regularity should be afforded to the president, that we should disregard his tweets and his statements and assume that the president's doing the right thing. The Supreme Court decided not to hold hearings on it, and so those other federal court cases seem to be moot at this point. We'll find out. So tonight, we have two gentlemen here to discuss this matter. John Malcolm, to my immediate right, is a graduate of Harvard Law School and holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Columbia College. He is the Heritage Foundation Ed and Sherry Gilbertson Senior Legal Fellow and Director of the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Um, he is also Chairman of the Criminal Law Practice Group of the Federalist Society and Chair-Elect of Boys Town, Washington, D.C., which provides homes and services to troubled families and children. From 2004 to 2009, Malcolm was Executive Vice President and Director of Worldwide Anti-Piracy Operations for the Motion Picture Association of America. And from 1990 to 1997, he was the assistant U.S. attorney in Atlanta, assigned to fraud and public corruption, the fraud and public corruption section, and also an associate uh, independent counsel investigating fraud and abuse in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. How about a round of applause? <laughs> to his right is our Randall Kelso. Mr. Kelso is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Law School and received a bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago. He is the Spurgeon E. Bell Distinguished Professor of Law at South Texas College of Law in Houston. 
He teaches and writes primarily in the areas of constitutional law and also teaches contracts and has taught professional responsibility and jurisprudence in the past. His articles have appeared in the Texas Law Review, Wisconsin Law Review, University of Pennsylvania Journal of Constitutional Law, Seton Hall uh, Journal of Constitutional Law, and other prestigious journals. Our format for tonight is 20 minutes for opening remarks, which will then be followed by seven minutes of rebuttal, and then three minutes in closing. We'll then offer an opportunity for question and answers. Um, by mutual agreement, um, <laughs> Mr. Malcolm is going to speak first. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't <laughs> offer you an opportunity for applause, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> I feel like this is a CNN debate. This is, uh, this is something. Um, with all due respect to, uh, to Paul, I, I will agree with him that in the various iterations of the presidential executive orders that they have improved, uh, I would disagree that the first one and secondly, the second one was so bereft of reason the courts were left with little uh, alternative but to strike them down. Uh, so let's talk about that. So, but I want to begin actually by thanking the Federalist Society for inviting me uh, here today. And I also want to thank Professor Kelso from venturing across town uh, in order to participate in this discussion. So on October 10th, the Supreme Court was going to hear oral argument in two consolidated cases, uh, Trump versus International Refugee Assistance Project and Trump versus uh, Hawaii. It is unclear at this time uh, whether or when the merits of that case will ultimately be argued for reasons that I will explain. But first, a little bit of history, a little review as to how we got here. So the case involves the so-called travel ban. In reality, a 90-day suspension uh, of admission of immigrants from six countries, specifically Syria, Iran, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, and Sudan, and a 120-day suspension of our refugee program. The case arrived at the Supreme Court when the government appealed adverse rulings from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, I want to say at the outset, I want to get a couple of things very clear. This case is not about whether you like Donald Trump or whether you think Donald Trump is a good president or a good person. This case is not about whether you think extreme vetting to combat the threats that we face from terrorism in this country is a good policy or a bad policy. This case is about whether under the Constitution and current Supreme Court precedent, the president, whether it's Donald Trump or Barack Obama or some future president, and Congress get to set that policy, and whether and under what circumstances a court gets to second guess that policy. Under our Constitution, Congress has plenary power to establish immigration policy. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. And Clause 4 gives Congress the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. In Section 212F of the Immigration and Nationality Act, Congress explicitly granted the President the authority to, quote, suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens for such period as he shall deem necessary when he finds that the entry of any alien or any class of aliens would be detrimental to the interests of the United States. Now, on January the 27th, President Trump signed the first of these executive orders in which he temporarily suspended the, the uh, issuance of visas subject to, and this continues through the other various iterations, case-by-case -case waivers from seven countries, the six that I previously mentioned, plus Iraq, and it temporarily suspended uh, the admission of refugees for a 120-day period, and it capped the number of admittees under our refugee program at 50,000 for fiscal year 2017. Now, while 50,000 is substantially lower than the number that have been admitted over the last few years, it is substantially higher than the number of, admitte of admittees who have come into this country during certain years. So for instance, in 2002, the, the year following the 9-11 attacks, our country admitted only 27,000 refugees under this program. Now, lawsuits were immediately filed challenging this order, and an injunction was entered, and the judge who entered the nationwide injunction pointed out that it was overbroad, and that if it was read literally, 
uh, that it would include people, for instance, who had let, were out of the country, who had green cards. If read literally, it would apply to people who were in this country illegally, who under binding Supreme Court precedent would have certain due process rights before they could be thrown out of the country. And rather than challenge this, on March the 6th, President Trump uh, issued what Paul said was a better uh, order. So we actually, he talked to some lawyers, I think he talked to lawyers the first time too. But he entered a revised uh, order in which he kept all of these things in place. He uh, took Iraq off of the list. Uh, he listed in the order itself reasons why the countries that were still uh, named, the six countries, uh, were in that list, obviously in an unclassified setting. And he directed the Secretary of Homeland Security to conduct a global review to determine whether foreign governments uh, were providing adequate information about their nationals who were applying to get visas to come into this country. Now, in that order, or I should say, so lawsuits challenging the legality of that order uh, were immediately filed in Hawaii and Maryland, and district court judges entered nationwide uh, injunctions against their implementation, and those orders were upheld by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in the case of Hawaii and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, in the case of um, Maryland, uh, both courts uh, that have an uh, overwhelming uh, majority of Democratic appointees, not that that always matters. The reasoning uh, behind the different uh, Court of Appeals decisions varied slightly. So the Fourth Circuit did so on the grounds that it believed that the President's order was motivated primarily by a desire to exclude Muslims from entering this country, not national security concerns, and that it therefore violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. The Fourth Circuit did this relying almost exclusively, as you heard, on a handful of tweets and statements made by then candidate Donald Trump and a few campaign surrogates such as Rudy Giuliani that initially spoke about a Muslim ban, it did, and then went on to say that we're actually going to look territory by territory to see whether there might be terrorist activity and, and see whether or not extreme vetting procedures uh, are appropriate. The Ninth Circuit uh, affirmed this injunction on the grounds that the President exceeded his authority that had been given to him under the Immigration and Nationality Act by not entering sufficient findings of fact to justify the exclusion uh, from these six countries. Both courts clearly believed that the President's stated reasons for issuing these executive orders were pretextual, and that his true motivation was, to, was based on religious animus against Muslims. Both of these opinions were dripping with hostility towards the President. Indeed, even the ACLU's lawyer, during the oral argument before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, said that the only reason that he was arguing that these executive orders were unconstitutional was because they had been signed by President Trump. And he acknowledged that if these orders had been signed by any other president, he would not be able to argue that these were unconstitutional. That is a rather remarkable concession. The Trump administration filed uh, an emergency appeal with the Supreme Court and in what has been characterized, correctly in my opinion, as a win for the president and a rebuke to the lower courts. The Supreme Court unanimously, I might add, lifted most of the nationwide injunctions that had been entered by the lower courts, thereby allowing the bulk of the president's travel ban to take effect uh, and to go into effect pending a decision on the merits by the high court. The court held that the only category uh, of individuals who could take advantage of the nationwide injunctions and continue to seek admission were those who had a well-established, documented, bona fide, close familial or business relationship with some individual or some entity within the United States. Justice Clarence Thomas, joined by Justices Samuel Alito and the newest Justice Neil Gorsuch, uh, they joined a partial dissent written by Justice Thomas in which they argued that the lower court's injunction should have been lifted in their entirety because government had made a strong showing that they were likely to succeed on the merits and that the failure to do so might imperil national security and almost certainly would invite more litigation which, of course, it did. The challengers immediately returned to their favorite courtroom in Hawaii before their favorite, favorite district court judge, Obama appointee, Derek Watson, who held that the Justice Department's guidance about what constituted a close family relationship and about uh, was too narrow and that it had to include cousins and in-laws. Uh, and he also held that if a refugee had a relationship of some kind with the Refugee Resettlement Agency, they could enter the country. 
The government appealed only the second uh, part of Judge Watson's order, and the Supreme Court, again unanimously, slapped it down and ruled in the government's favor, saying that the lower courts had gone too far. Now, although the predicting the outcome of any Supreme Court case is truly a perilous undertaking, I believe that this bodes very well for the president. After all, the court decided to take up this case, even though there was no split among the lower courts uh, on, the, uh, on the issues involved in the case. And they also decided to grant the case almost immediately after receiving briefs uh, filed by the parties who had done so on an expedited basis. I think, for reasons I'll discuss in a minute, the precedent is on the president's side and that he is likely to win if the court decides to hear the merits of the case. They may not. So as I said, the court unanimously lifted the lower court injunction and allowed the bulk of the president's uh, travel, so-called travel ban to go into place. That lasted 90 days. The 90-day suspension period lapsed last Sunday and has now been replaced by a new policy. The new presidential proclamation describes that the Secretary of Homeland Security was tasked with creating a baseline of criteria uh, for countries to meet uh, before they could have their nationals admitted, and that nearly 200 countries were measured against these criteria that, uh, that he had, or she actually, he's uh, Homeland Security Secretary, had established. After that review, 16 countries were uh, deficient uh, in terms of not meeting those criteria, and another 31 countries were deemed to be at risk of not being deficient. This actually began a period of a couple of months uh, of engagement by our government with each of these countries to try to address these various deficiencies. And in the end, the new order that has been issued, Sudan has now been uh, removed from the list, and the conditions that apply to the remaining five countries have been modified somewhat, and restrictions have been imposed on three new countries, Chad, North Korea, and Venezuela. Uh, and of course, North Korea and Venezuela are not majority Muslim countries. The order, the order also describes, again, in an unclassified setting, it says that there's other classified information that obviously can't be put in the uh, presidential proclamation, why each of these countries uh, is on, uh, on the list, and what restrictions apply to each of these countries. So there is a possibility that the Supreme Court may now decide that the case, at least as originally framed, is no longer an active case or controversy, and to use a legal phrase, is now moot. The parties are in the process of addressing that issue right now. So it is unclear at this point whether the court is going to keep the case and reschedule the case for oral argument at some date in the future, or whether it is going to essentially punt the case, dismiss it as having been improvidently granted, and send it back to the lower courts to let it percolate down there for a while. I really think that it could go either way, and there are good and cogent reasons, which I'm happy to offer later if you want, as to why they could go in either direction. However, as I said, uh, if the court decides to keep the case and reach the merits, I believe that President uh, Trump will win on both the law uh, and because Unlike domestic legal disputes, courts lack institutional expertise to assess threats from abroad and to set national security policy. In 1952, the Supreme Court decided Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer. It's a very famous case. It has now come to be known as the Steel Seizure case. In that case, the Supreme Court rebuked then President Harry Truman for attempting to seize private property in that case, steel mills, in the absence of any specific enumerated authority in Article II of the Constitution, which is the part of the Constitution that talks about what presidential powers are, and in the absence of any statutory authority that he had been given from Congress. In a concurring opinion, Justice Robert Jackson set forth the standards that since that day have been used by scholars and judges and members of Congress to describe and assess the reach of executive power. In that opinion, Justice Jackson described three different scenarios. The first scenario is as follows, I quote, when the president takes measures incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress, so against the wishes of Congress, his power is at its lowest ebb, for then he can rely only upon his own constitutional powers, minus any constitutional powers of Congress over the matter. In such circumstances, Jackson stated, court should review a president's actions with caution. 
The second or middle scenario is as follows. When the president acts in the absence of either congressional grant or denial of authority, he can only rely upon his own, his own independent powers, but there is a zone of twilight in which he and Congress may have concurrent authority or in which its distribution is uncertain. The third scenario is when the president acts pursuant to, an, pursuant to an express or implied authorization of Congress with their permission. In such circumstances, Jackson stated, the president's authority is at its maximum, for it includes all all the power, all he possesses in his own right, plus all that Congress can delegate. In these circumstances, and in these circumstances only, may it be said, may he be said, the president, to personify the federal sovereignty. If his act is held unconstitutional under these circumstances, it usually means that the federal government, as an undivided whole, lacks power. With respect to the revised travel order, it is clear that we are talking about the third scenario, the one in which the president's authority is at his maximum. As the court stated in a 1950 opinion, Knopf versus Shaughnessy, quote, the exclusion of aliens is a fundamental act of sovereignty that resides in the legislative power and also is inherent in the executive power to control the foreign affairs of the nation. Not only does the president have direct authority under Article II of the Constitution in the area of foreign relations and national security, but as I stated earlier, Congress has given the president explicit statutory story authority to suspend the entry of any aliens or class of aliens from any country when he thinks that not doing so would be detrimental to the interests of the United States. Moreover, courts have traditionally accorded great deference to the executive branch when it comes to national security issues, and for good reason. Presidents are given primary responsibility for protecting our homeland. Federal judges are not. Presidents receive daily classified intelligence briefings about the many threats that we face. Leaders in Congress regularly receive such briefings. Federal judges do not. Just last term, in Ziegler versus Abbasi, Justice Anthony Kennedy, writing for the majority, and just days before the court granted certiorari in the travel ban case, stated the following. National security policy is the prerogative of the Congress and President. Judicial inquiry into the national security realm raises concerns for the separation of powers, entrenching on matters committed to the other branches. Moreover, as the court acknowledged in the 1999 case, Reno versus uh, Amer American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, courts are, quote, ill-equipped to determine the authenticity and utterly unable to assess the adequacy of a president's reasons for deeming nationals of a particular country a special threat. And as the court stated in 2010 in another case, let's bear the name, quote, when it comes to collecting evidence and drawing factual inferences in the area of national security, the lack of competence on behalf of the courts is marked and respect for the government's conclusions is appropriate. For this reason, as it reiterated in Fiala versus Bell in 1977, the court has, quote, long recognized the power to expel or exclude aliens as a fundamental sovereign attribute exercised by the government's political departments, largely immune from judicial control. For these reasons, among others, the court held in Klein Deeds versus Mandel in 1972 that when the executive branch makes a decision to exclude an alien from admission into this country, quote, on the basis of a facially legitimate and bona fide reasons, that the courts may neither look behind the exercise of that discretion nor test it by balancing its justification against the constitutional interests of those who might be affected if an applicant is denied a visa. Justice Anthony Kennedy reiterated the precise point just a couple of years ago in the concurring opinion of Perry versus Davey. Yet yeah, that is precisely what the lower courts did in this case. They looked behind the president's exercise of its discretion and balanced its justification against the constitutional interests of people who, in fact, have no constitutional right to enter our country. They looked behind the state facially legitimate bona fide reasons for the exercise of the president's discretion in order to discern some darker, hidden motive on his part. 
judges should not second guess presidential authority based on some hidden intent divine from tweets by the president or, can, or statements uh, by surrogates during the heat of a presidential campaign. The lower courts, and perhaps many of you, may have taken the measure of President Trump, the man and the executive, and found him lacking. But it is the job of judges to apply the law, not to try to psychoanalyze our commander in chief. And it is for that reason, if the court decides to reach the merits of the case, that I believe that they should reverse the lower court decisions and uphold the president's authority to implement his revised uh, executive order, and a contrary result would needlessly imperil national security, and it would do great damage to the structure of our constitution.
over 700 prisoners uh, at one point in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, at the time Obama became president, it was down to 250. The Bush administration released the whole rest of them, realizing that they had sort of mistakenly picked them up, or they weren't all that bad actors, uh, or uh, they didn't really uh, have the kind of evidence they wanted to, to keep them at Guantanamo Bay. Um, so by the time you got to the court saying what you're doing is unconstitutional, a large, over half of them been released anyway. Um, President Obama then, under the new rules, they processed some of these people, but they, Obama released a bunch of them uh, as well uh, during his administration. Uh, so by the time you get to 2016, there were only 41 prisoners left in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, the rest have all been uh, released, uh, but almost none of them were released because of the court's decisions. <coughs> Uh, and now the court decisions may be in some respects say you've got to give them some due process protections after 2008 resulted in some hearings where the government had to admit, yeah, we don't even under minimal due process have any evidence to detain these guys. But a lot of them probably would have been released anyway. They were, a lot of them were released under the Bush administration before those rulings were, were, took place. Uh, so the reality is, despite the court's ruling, the Bush policy really controlled Guantanamo Bay for 95% of what Bush wanted to do. Um, okay. Then this Trump travel. You know, I'm going to argue right now both the points on why I think it's unconstitutional and violates uh, statutory guidelines. <laughs> and I think what's going to find them uh, when, they, when they get to the case eventually. But you know, if Trump wins the case, he gets 100% of what he wants. If he loses the case, he'll still get 95% of what he wants. Uh, because even under uh, existing extreme vetting procedures in the Obama administration, you could exclude a lot of the people he wants to exclude on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, the court striking down these, quote, travel bans, and they're not bans in any of them. There are uh, always exceptions uh, that are in these uh, uh, presidential executive orders and in this new proclamation. The real big difference is, under the Obama policy, if the president and, or then the administrative agents looking on a case-by-case -case basis, wanted to exclude someone, they had to prove they were a national security risk. Under the Trump the proclamations, there's a presumption that the individuals from these countries are national security risks, but they get a waiver if they can prove they're not a national security risk. The real difference is shifting the presumption of proof as to whether they're a national security risk or not. That's really what's going on. These are not absolute bans. They're, they're waivers in, 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 in these orders. Um, so I don't think at the end of the day, it's not going to make a great deal of difference. Trump's going to get pretty much what he wants, whether the courts rules for or against him. It'll be a nice symbolic thing, just like ruling that President Bush didn't have unilateral authority to take people to Guantanamo and Hamlet, and just like Congress didn't have unilateral authority to pretty much deny Guantanamo prisoners any due process rights in New Medellin. Um, but it didn't really affect much of what actually happened on the ground with respect to Guantanamo prisoners. And I don't think anything the court does is actually going to affect much of immigration policy. And on the refugee side, I mean, he hadn't come up, Trump hadn't come up with his new refugee policy yet, because that means 120 days. He's got another month before that one expires. But he'll come up with a new uh, refugee policy, and he's already talked about limiting the number of refugees, and he'll get that. He'll get all of that uh, if he wants. Okay. So we ought to just be aware that even if the court rules against Trump, he's still going to get 95% of what he wants anyway. Okay, now we'll look at the, the actual reasons why I think he's going to lose, at least symbolically, that, uh, that uh, decision out there. Um, the first thing, though, is statutorily. There are two statutes here that are in play that the courts have been talking about. Uh, one is the statute that, that was cited. That the president has authority to ban someone from ag international security. And certainly, that that's one statute. Uh, the other statute Congress has is you can't discriminate in making immigration decisions on religion, ethnicity, national origin grounds. That's another statute Congress has. They're both in the immigration laws. The question is, how do you read those two statutory provisions together in light of what uh, President Trump is doing? Um, the Ninth Circuit, when they ruled that the president behaved unlawfully, they ruled on statutory grounds that the provision about not discriminating on grounds of religion and ethnicity and national origin um, Trump, the provision about the national security, that, that, that Trump really was doing it on uh, discriminatory grounds, and therefore he wasn't at the highest level under the Youngstown Chief Jackson of doing it with express or applied congressional authorization. 
that Trump was acting under the lowest of standard in the Jackson opinion, doing pursuant to it, sort of express or imply congressional disapproval. They had disapproved that kind of uh, ethnic or religious discrimination in immigration policy. Um, so in terms of the president's authority under uh, the Youngstown uh, sheet case, and in terms of reading the statutes, it really depends how you view Trump's actions. Do you view them more as Muslim ban, ethnicity driven, uh, or as really national security driven? And that's what the courts are really going to be looking at. And part of the problem is none of the countries in the first ban, the second ban, or the third ban has ever had an individual immigrate to the United States and cause a national security problem. None. Not in 40 years. Uh, they've been keeping pretty good records of it. It's not clear there's any real national security problem here that Trump is addressing. He said during the campaign, oh, the Obama administration is too lax. They're, they're letting people in. They don't have proper vetting as a political matter during the campaign. Uh, okay, that's fine. It's a political rhetoric. Uh, but is it really true? Is there actually a problem here? Uh, I'm not sure there is a problem. I think these travel bans basically are Trump saying, I said it during the campaign, and I'm going to pretend like it really was true. And therefore, I want to have travel bans that are more tough than Obama because I think there's a real problem here. But it's unclear to me that there's any evidence that there is an actual national security problem you're addressing. And that's what hurt them in the first round of cases. Remember the first one? The attorneys came in, they didn't really have much, they weren't briefed very well, they didn't have much evidence of what the national security problem was. Now, this time around, as was indicated, They've done a long more process of looking at countries, and this country and that country, and this is why we're doing it. The attorneys should be able to make more of a case now than they did six months ago in the district courts and court of appeals, that there is an actual national security problem. If they can make that case, they've got a better chance of success. So I think they have a better chance of success now than they did six months ago. But I am not confident they're going to be able to make that case. But they better be prepared to make the case. They better be prepared to argue what the national security problem is that exists because, uh, and we need, therefore, this more extreme policy than under the Obama administration. Um, and we'll see. I think that'll be a focus of what the court's going to look at. If there is a national security problem, then you're under the highest level, under the Jackson thing. Then you've got to focus on national security and President Trump's in better shape. If you don't make a very good case that there's a real problem, that it was just political rhetoric during the campaign, and now you're trying to sort of pretend like political rhetoric is real, um, well then, then you got a big problem. And then, then I think there's got a bigger problem. Now, I do think, though, if the court strikes it down, it'll be on that statutory grounds. I don't think the court will do what the Fourth Circuit did and find that there was a, a constitutional establishment clause problem. The court, I don't think, wants to have this be a major constitutional issue. I think the, the judges, particularly the the Democratic appointed court justices, who are more similar to the Ninth Circuit in their, their ideology and how they think about issues, uh, they're likely to want to do this on more narrow statutory grounds the way the Ninth Circuit did. And it'll be sort of that interplay of those statutory sections, my guess is, that will determine uh, the result. Um, okay, I'll make two final quick points. Uh, one thing I'm sort of surprised about uh, is that in the lead up to this, of course, with respect to the immigrants who had bona fide family connections. Originally, the Trump administration tried to limit it to a very sort of narrow range of family connections. Uh, the Hawaii court said, no, family connections include grandparents and uncles and cousins. All, all of those are bona fide family member connections, uh, and the travel ban can't apply to them. Um, the Supreme Court allowed that to continue. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, did not say Trump administration could have their narrow interpretation of bona fide family members uh, control. Um, my guess is there's a likely chance of success, uh, at least on that part, because this new policy, the new third that they just adopted, as I read it, again tries to say, even if you've got a bona fide family member connection that's connected to your immigration uh, application, the ban still applies to you. Uh, and that was struck down uh, under the, uh, the earlier decisions. That was not stayed. The injunctions against that part of it continue, uh, and they're still in place today. Uh, I don't think the Trump is going to win on that. I think they're going to lose at least on that piece of it. Uh, immigrants who have bona fide family connections. Uh, so I think the Supreme Court suggested there's a likelihood of success on that one. That's why they allowed that stay of that part of the 
initial policy to continue. But we'll see. Uh, we'll see. But again, that would just be a minor bunch of individuals, uh, as opposed to all the individuals in those countries. So again, that's a, you know, Trump gets 95% of what he wants and loses 5% of the vote of five family member connections. Um, final thing I'll say in terms of deference to the president. Um, in general, typically, as indicated, there are a lot of cases talking about deference to the president uh, by uh, the court, uh, in particularly national security matters. Um, particularly decided by you know, Justice Kennedy and Justice Roberts, who are likely to be the swing votes in this case. Uh, because Thomas Alito and Gorsuch are going to support the president, you know that. The four Democratic appointed justices are going to do a Ninth Circuit kind of thing, or maybe Fourth Circuit. They're going to be fighting against Trump uh, to some extent. You just know that. Uh, the case is going to come down to Roberts and Kennedy. Um, and typically, and particularly Roberts, the first, but Kennedy also has strong language about it. typical in these areas of national security to refer to presidents generally. Um, but I'm not so sure uh, in, in this case uh, for this reason. Uh, and it's something that with all the hurricanes of, from Harvey and Irma and uh, now Puerto Rico and, and, and with other events and United Nations uh, speeches opening and trouble with North Korea and all, all the other things, didn't get as much play in the press. Um, but when President Trump pardoned Joe Arpaio out there in Arizona, that is a dagger blow at the rule of law. It is just outrageous. Joe Arpaio violated court orders not to discriminate against the Hispanics in the enforcement of his policing policies asking for visas. The court found, told him to stop it. He didn't stop it. He continued. The court found him in criminal contempt of court. And before the court could even sentence him, criminal contempt, Trump pardoned him, said, doesn't matter. I don't care that you violated a court order. I don't care that a court put you under contempt of court. You're free. That is a dagger in the heart of the rule of law. That Kennedy and Roberts, I just can't imagine how angry they were when that happened. And particularly Kennedy, because I know him, I know him better. Um, he is a strong believer that the rule of law, when a court rules it in a matter, it ought, it ought to be respected. And when someone violates that and is held in criminal contempt, and then the president says, doesn't matter, I'm letting you go free. I think Trump has done himself a world of disservice in getting any deference from Kennedy or Roberts on the court in any later case. And I think that means there's going to be a little more vigorous questioning. What is the real reason behind this travel ban policy? Is it really national security or is it just politics? Because that pardoning of Opeo was clearly politics. It had nothing to do with any legitimate reason that any president ever has used to pardon an individual. Not even Nixon in his most laws. He didn't pardon any of the people convicted in the Watergate matters. And in fact, when he was told to turn over the tape, he turned him over. He didn't destroy it. He didn't refuse it. He followed the law. Even Nixon followed the law. And he didn't pardon people. But Trump has indicated a willingness to do that. Um, and I think that will make a real difference in terms of how Roberts and Kennedy view Trump and the deference they're going to give him. So, as I say, at the end of the day, we'll see. I think it's a lot closer on the statutory case, of, depending on how you view the reading of the two statutes together. Um, I think they're not going to give deference to Trump in the way they might give to other presidents. They're going to really force them to justify why, what is the national security problem here that you're addressing, and that this really is national security, not just politics. Um, and at, at the end of the day, I think they're going to see it more as politics. And I think either Kennedy, or both Kennedy and Roberts, but you know, the only one of them to join the four Democrats to, to strike down with the travel ban. And I can see that they'll probably do that. But as I say, it won't make much difference. Trump is looking at 95% of what he wants anyway. How are you doing? Oh, you're a Oh, how about that? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Let me make a few a sort of quick hit points and get to the points that I, I really want to talk about, which is Professor Kelso said that the Supreme Court let stand the injunctions uh, about allowing expanding the group of, uh, of bona fide relation, family member relationships, cousins and in-laws. Uh, that's actually not uh, that's not technically correct. Uh, the lower court entered those injunctions. Bush administration did not appeal, not Bush administration, Trump administration did not appeal oh, that right. portion. But they're still in place. The Supreme Court didn't allow us to see our place, but not because the Supreme Court was a stand. Trump administration didn't challenge it. You also point out, and I'm not sure this is right, 
that the four democratically appointed justices, that they are definitely going to rule against Trump. I would note that when the Supreme Court lifted the bulk of these injunctions, uh, they did that unanimously. And part of that involves a finding, at least an implicit finding, by the court, all of them, that the government made a strong showing that they are likely to succeed uh, on the merits. And I'm not going to defend, uh, to some of you, uh, the pardon of, of Joe Arpaio. I suppose that justice on the Supreme Court may be offended by it, or may be offended by it. Um, but I will say, I find it passing strange to say that that is a dagger uh, in the heart of the rule of law. If there's anything that is crystal clear, it's the president's uh, constitutional prerogatives virtually unfettered uh, to enter uh, pardons. I mean, Barack Obama, there were a lot of people who didn't like the fact that he granted more clemency petitions like the past 12 presidents uh, combined. He violated the standards that he had set out for how he was going to evaluate the clemency petitions. Nonetheless, he has clear constitutional prerogative uh, to do so. So people may like or not like the policy matters, but it's not a dagger in the heart of the wall. Now let me get to the few of the points that I, I, I really want to hit upon, which is, uh, so you said, well, you know, there's no proof that any of the people from these countries, various people, have actually caused, caused any kind of problem uh, here in this country. You know, nobody's been killed as a result of people coming in from this country. Uh, and I would say, uh, one, we cannot ignore what has happened in Spain, Germany, France, the UK, there are lots of terrorist attacks that have happened. People have lost their lives, and they involve refugees and immigrants who have come from these countries. It is also, by the way, not true that people from the countries that are designated uh, in the executive order have not been convicted of terrorism-related offenses in this country. Lots of them have been convicted of terrorism-related offenses. What they haven't done is had somebody killed as a result of somebody uh, who came from those countries. There have been lots of people in these countries who have been convicted of terrorism or related offenses. You also said something that I find very strange and frankly just wrong. You said, well, there was extreme vetting uh, under President Obama, and you know, even if he loses, President Trump is going to get 95% of what he wants. What all they'll have to do is prove that the individual applicant is some kind of a, a security threat. I can assure you that that is not a win for, uh, for President Trump. The thing that unifies all of these countries, and I'm going to go through them all in just a moment, there is one thing that unifies all of these countries. They either do not do proper vetting themselves because they lack capacity, or they do not cooperate with us. Now, just like cyber hackers, you know, a lot of times when they're looking to infiltrate, a hacker will not go directly into your computer because they can't. They will look for vulnerabilities. And these countries are the vulnerabilities that exist for entering this country. And by the way, if this was a Muslim thing, if this was a Muslim thing, it's a pretty bad Muslim thing. <laughs> there are six countries, and I'm not meaning to, to mitigate the impact of people from these countries. That's real. But we are talking about six countries out of 49 majority Muslim countries uh, around them. The largest, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, the Philippines, totally unaffected uh, by any of this. Those countries constitute less than 10% uh, of, the, um, uh, of the Muslims uh, in this country. Now, I just think all you got to do is look at the countries that are now in the revised executive order. You've got Chad. Well, first of all, there have been travel advisors for forever in the Obama administration, the State Department, and Britain's Foreign Office against any travel to Chad. They don't have adequately share information with us. There are several terrorist groups that are uh, running rampant in Chad, including Boko Haram, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the Islamic threat. You have Iran. Iran clearly fails to co cooperate with us. They are a significant source of threats. They are a state sponsor of terrorism. They hate us. <laughs> they are clearly a threat to this country. They will also, by the way, if any uh, Iranian is deemed deportable, they will refuse to take uh, any Iranian back into their country. Libya. Libya has massive capacity uh, problems. They don't have any ability to identify whether applicants are, in fact, the people they pretend uh, to be. They also haven't fully cooperated with our country, and for good reason. The country is basically involved in a massive civil war ever since Muammar Gaddafi uh, was dethroned, and large swaths of that country are, in fact, controlled by ISIS and Al-Qaeda. North Korea, not said. 
you know, no cooperation with us. They have now said it is inevitable that they are going to say they send an intercontinental ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead to strike the United States. Somalia, significant uh, capacity uh, issues. It is a terrorist safe haven. There have been lots of Somalis in this country convicted of terrorism related offenses. It is a gateway for people who are traveling from this country to trade uh, to train with terrorist groups. That country has been locked in a civil war for decades. They barely have control of the capital of Mogadishu. That, that country is awash with Al Shabaab, who means uh, us harm. Syria, enough said. Hezbollah, ISIS, Al Qaeda, all active in that country. That, active, that country has the support uh, of Iran, and needless to say, is not a friend of the United States uh, and has used chemical uh, weapons. Uh, Venezuela, in fact, citizens from Venezuela or nationals from Venezuela are going to be able uh, to come to our country. Now, the revised order, it's only government officials, and not just all government officials, government officials from particular agencies. The executive order makes it very clear that we have other sources to get information about the nationals from that country, but there is no cooperation from the Venezuelan government on Nicolas Maduro, and in fact the United States has sanctioned dozens of individuals from the particular agencies that are involved for being ties to drug traffickers. Supporters uh, of terrorism, including providing uh, falsified passports and visas, and also human rights violators. And finally, Yemen, and I will sit down. Yemen is in the middle of a massive civil war. They are fighting Al Qaeda. There is a civil war going on in which they are fighting Houthi rebels that are, by the way, supported by the Iranians. They are very good, even based on unclassified information, facially legitimate bona fide national security risks posed by these countries, and that's why they're on the list for good and sufficient reasons. Okay, well that's sort of what the, I hope, the attorneys who argue for President Trump do as good a job as he did trying to explain why there's a real problem here. If they do, they got a better chance of winning. Uh, but I'll, 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 I'll First, Venezuela. We're not stopping their citizens, we're stopping a few of their government officials. And that's just a pure diplomatic move uh, against the Maduro, Maduro government, which is clamping down on rights in that country because he's losing control. He doesn't have the support anymore in the way Hugo Chavez, who was very, uh, uh, very charismatic, had uh, before him. Um, it's a good policy. I, I, I support that we've got to sort of to take into account the deteriorating situation in Venezuela. Um, but it has nothing to do with what the rest of this, the, this travel ban is about. It, it's purely a diplomatic uh, move against uh, certain Venezuelan officials. It's uh, irrelevant to the overall travel ban. Uh, North Korea, almost no immigration comes from North Korea anyway. They don't let people out. They don't like this. They're, they're, they're going at all. Uh, and, and I think in 2016, I think the figure is there were six immigrant visas and maybe 60 non-immigrant visas processed for the entire year of 2016 uh, out of North Korea. Um, the number of them is so small and, and, and so minimal uh, that, yeah, the travel, you say, okay, we're not going to do those. Although many of those people, there were sensible good reasons for maintaining at least some contact with some of those North Koreans coming to the United States for meetings or conferences or other things like that on the non immigrant status and going back. Uh, cutting that off is just bad policy to, to cut off the connections with anyone in, in North Korea. Uh, but, of course, the president's policy on North Korea, I mean, it's just the whole situation is just so absurd. Uh, got a uh, sort of a tin pot dictator with the maturity of about a five-year-old, and then you got President Trump tweeting with the maturity of about a ten-year-old. You know, it's just nonsense what's going on there. Uh, so I'm not even sure that the, the policy makes any sense diplomatically in North Korea. The policy of Venezuela, I understand, but North Korea, I think the whole thing is just a nuisance mess. But again, it has nothing to do with the rest of this. So uh, this policy is going to rise or fall on the other countries in the Middle East that are Muslim countries. Uh, the inclusion of Venezuela and North Korea to say, oh, it's not a Muslim ban, is just laughable uh, in, in terms of, you know, it's, no, nobody's going to say, oh, well, it's not a Muslim ban because you include these two countries for these other reasons. Um, so you've got to say, well, of, of the you know, 49 majority Muslim countries, why these six? And can we explain why we decided these six and why did we replace uh, <coughs> Sudan with Chad? Uh, and um, you know, to the extent you can make a kind of argument that there is a, a real risk uh, here that needed more vetting than happened under the Obama administration that justifies these new travel ban procedures, um, then you've got more of a real argument that your 
following the Section 212F uh, of the Immigration Act that the President has statutory authority to do it. Uh, I think the court's going to sort of ask real careful questions about that. They're not just going to say, oh, you spent six months reviewing it, and you looked at a lot of countries. They're going to ask, what did you do, really? What did you look at? What was your evidence that you came up with? I think they're going to go behind conclusory statements uh, to try to determine the, the extent to which it, it is really national security, not, not politics. And I'm not confident when they do that, they will get both the votes of Kennedy and Roberts. Uh, but maybe they will. On the imperial pardon issue, of course the president has the right to pardon. That's what's so dangerous. It's not that it's unconstitutionally pardoned by bail. It's just it's such a horribly misguided use of the pardon power uh, to pardon someone who's been found in criminal contempt of violating a court order. You know, nobody does that. Well, I'm never did that. He pardoned certain people who had larger drug sentences and maybe they were, uh, maybe it made sense because at the time crack cocaine had larger punishments than powder cocaine and things like that. Uh, but I can't think of any president who's, who's pardoned someone uh, purely, I think, on political grounds, appealing to his base, to let someone out in criminal contempt without any national public policy reason to support him. And I don't care about Joe Arpaio. He's 85 years old. He's retired. But he got six months in prison for criminal contempt. And who cares? I don't care. Uh, but to me, it, it sends a really bad signal. And the real thing, probably over the next six months to look for, is not going to be this travel ban, which I think, you know, at the end of the day, won't make much difference. It's going to be as the Russian investigation starts indicting people. And they're going to indict Manafort, and they're going to indict Flynn, and they're probably going to indict some of the other uh, uh, Trump campaign officials who had more meetings with Russia than they initially admitted. But then they're going to turn to all the finance stuff, and all the money laundering, Russian money laundering stuff. And that starts getting close to Trump, and Trump Jr., and Jared Kushner. And once those people start being, they're already looking at their IRS, Terms and all that. What Trump does in terms of use of his pardon power for all of those individuals, that to me is likely to be much more what we're talking about in six months than whatever happens with this travel ban. And that's why I'm so concerned about it. To me, it's a signal that Trump is willing to use his constitutional pardon power in ways that you know, no other president has thought it appropriate to use. And we'll see. Hopefully, it's not. Hopefully, it's a, it's a one off kind of thing. I'm not, I'm not confident either. Thank you. Brief concluding remarks, then we'll have time for questions and have answers. Our questions. So let me complete one thought, which I, I agree with Professor Kelso, which is he pointed out that you know, North Korea, almost nobody comes here uh, to this country from North Korea. He's absolutely uh, correct. And with respect to Venezuela, he said it's purely a diplomatic uh, move against government officials and the government. Well, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, one of the things about this is it's designed to get government officials to, in fact, cooperate with us. We may have alternative sources of information, but the officials who are, who are, are named uh, in the Maduro government certainly do not cooperate with us in any way, shape, or form. However, the argument, that's the argument for why the court would conceivably to keep the case. You're going to say, well, we're only a small, nobody from North Korea, a very, very small group of people from Venezuela, and all you've done is remove Sudan and you've substituted Chad. So really, if you think that this is a Muslim ban, don't, then you know, the case still remains uh, live. I, I'm, I'm again struck by, uh, by the Joe Arpaio uh, example. You know, I, um, boy, I, what an affront to dignity. My God, he actually pardoned somebody who had had a finding of contempt by a judge, as if that is the worst case of, uh, of the exercise of the pardon uh, power. My God, Barack Obama pardoned a Puerto Rican terrorist. Uh, at the behest of uh, Lynn Emanuel of Hamilton fame, uh, who had killed uh, law enforcement officers. Uh, Bill Clinton, pardoned financier, Mark Richard, who charged with serious crimes, who fled the country. He didn't even come back here to face charges, and he got pardoned. What was the excuse for pardoning him? He was a major donor to the Democrats and to Bill Clinton and to the Clinton Library. Well, talk about an affront to the justice system. I would take more issue with those parties and others as well uh, than it would be Arpaio a pardon, even though I wouldn't had I been president pardon Joe Arpaio. Look, we need to protect our home. We cannot wait and ignore what has been happening around the world. We cannot deal with countries that are either safe havens for terrorists, do not cooperate with us, or for whatever reasons 
good countries that would like to cooperate with us, like Chad, like uh, Somalia, that simply lack the capacity. They either don't have control of a country, or they don't have the institutional capability to be able to determine, is the person who is applying for this visa really what they claim to be, and what can we find, about, find out about their intent to enter the country? The president has the primary constitutional responsibility to keep us safe. That has always been the case, and has certainly been heightened since 9-11. The threats against us have not diminished, have not diminished. Cannot afford to put on blinders and say, other than you know, the Dr. Hassan Malik who kills a few people, you know, little incidents here and there, that the threat has receded. It has not receded. Anything, it has increased. And the president is proceeding, in my view, whether you like him or not, whether you like his tweets or not, in an appropriate way to keep us safe. There are a lot of countries not on this list where there's more of a track record of people uh, with serious interest against the United States uh, coming from. Uh, I'm not confident that the named countries in this order are the best countries to name, but that will be part of the, the, the debate for the Supreme Court is to what extent can the, the President make the argument that there's at least some rational basis for these countries and not include Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or other countries. Uh, you can understand politically why he doesn't want to include Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or other Afghanistan or countries like that. But if you're actually worried about terrorism, um, yeah, uh, it's not clear to me why the countries that are included are there and why the countries that are not included are there. But we'll see. The, the, the part of the Thank you. Do we have a question? While you're waiting for a hand, please, can I just respond very quickly what you just said? Sure. Okay. I'll tell you why. I mean, look, I worry about Saudi Arabia. Pakistan and Afghanistan, worry about every country around the world that needs this harm, and there are plenty of them uh, that do. The difference is those are functioning governments. They are governments in which we have a diplomatic and military presence. They cooperate with us. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's a willingness and an institutional capacity that is at issue, not where do dangerous people emanate from. There are dangerous people that emanate just about every country, and there are dangerous people within this country. It is the capacity and willingness of the government to do as best it can to try to prevent harm for our own. And that's what distinguishes these countries. Maybe there should be others that should be on the list. The ones that are on the list, we clearly did that happen. But the 9-11 terrorists came from Saudi Arabia. They didn't. They didn't inhibit that at all. I don't know what you mean they didn't inhibit that at all. Inhibit that at all. Well, first what of all. What did Saudi Arabia do to inhibit 9-11? First of all, 9-11 was a wake-up call. You know, I mean, the, the procedures that existed before 9-11 on a whole host of issues, uh, everything from cooperation between our intelligence authorities and our domestic law enforcement authorities, the wall of separation. There were lots of problems with 9-11. Our intelligence capabilities were dramatically lacking uh, and had been allowed to, uh, to diminish. It is a question of, is there a functioning government in Saudi Arabia? Yes, there is. Are they cooperating with us against the war on terrorism? Yes, they are. And do they have the institutional capacity to find out, perhaps in the fashion in the case of, of Saudi Arabia, who it is who is seeking to emanate really from that country uh, to our country? It's a capacity issue, not that bad people. I mean, there are, there are bad people in lots and lots of countries, including Central American countries where, where uh, Al-Qaeda uh, has a present, you know, presence down in places like Paraguay and there are, there are human smugglers. As I say, terrorists look for vulnerabilities. And they will take advantage of those vulnerabilities wherever and however they can. What kind of cooperation, what kind of capacity are we talking about from the governments from whence those terrorists were?